Michael knows this. I used to, we used to, he still does this. We used to go to events and record people and they're there to give their talk and you're there to get a recording and when you ask people to check their mic, they'll say, check, check, one, two, three, check, is that good? Check, check, one, two, three. And you're trying to set a level, you need them to talk as loud as they're gonna talk. One, two, three, is this too loud? Good, 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 okay. All right. So, um, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this church. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for your word. We ask that you would work through your Holy Spirit in your mercy to each one as we come acknowledging our sin, but trusting in you totally. We ask that you would reveal to us and to each heart here your truth from your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So um, about 20 years ago, I, I think it's, I'm gonna guess, 20 years ago, um, there was a sermon given here at Fellowship Chapel Charlie Clough was filling in for Pastor Mike. And I believe the sermon was about um, how believers can reason through, or what's the word I'm looking for? Um, make the case for their salvation legally, their justification, that we have imputed righteousness from God. Um, we don't earn it. Um, but it's also not based on God's caprice. It's not... Um, God just doesn't say, well, you know, forgiveness is good. I remember seeing years ago, it was like, a, it was an Oprah, and, and something had happened, and the person said about forgiveness, some horrible thing had happened, I think it was like a drunk driving thing, and this woman had been badly burned, and the subject of forgiveness came up, she wanted to forgive, and she said, well, forgiveness is good for the soul, and, and that is true. But the sermon that morning was about how it's not because God is being nice or it's good for us, it's healthy to forgive. Um, he paid for our righteousness. He paid for it. And we can justify it legally from the scriptures, not from our feelings, our own conscience, anything like that. Um, and so that was the, what the sermon was about, best I can remember. But what I clearly remember is something I'm gonna try to quote to you is how he opened it. And he said, folks, right now, at the right hand of God Almighty, there is sitting a member of the human race. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way. As we talk about the incarnation, we think of Jesus coming as a baby. But right now, there's a human, a human being sitting next to God. That's what the scriptures say. If you're going to believe it or not, but there it is. It's easy to drift into an idea that um, God became, though it says, the Bible says the word became flesh, and it's intentionally I think the word became flesh and not God became a man, and we're going to get into that. But it's easy to drift into an idea that, well, God put on a suit that looked like a person, and then he, it was like he was in a costume. Or if you ever see an invisible man movie or invisible woman, they have to put, cover themselves with makeup and wear like extra clothes and gloves so that they appear because they're invisible. He says, I have to put on all this stuff. And if they take it off, they're invisible, you know? They, but um, Jesus didn't unbecome a human. He didn't unbecome a man. When he ascended, the Bible teaches, he ascended in a resurrection body. And we'll get into this more the next time, I think, the next time I'm up here, but uh, that that's our hope. Our hope is a resurrected body. Our hope is not becoming an angel or a spirit. It's, it's to be who we were created to be. And I hope to make a case to you this morning. I have the task of application, but I'm going to tell you in advance, there's only one point of application and it comes at the end. But I have to build up the case for you or else I, I think you, you might not uh, apply it. And I want to take you on a journey of discovery that I went through and I, I hope it blesses you. I don't have anything to teach you. The scriptures have something to teach you. And the Holy Spirit has something to teach you. So my title here, God's Eternal Plan Manifest in History. Are we doing this too? I, I can pull it. Is this good? Okay. God's Eternal Plan Manifest in History and the Basis for Assurance. All right. There's a verse here in Timothy, the context of which is uh, praying for leaders and praying um, 
We should lift up holy hands, praying, making intercession. And then this verse is thrown in here in verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, plural, the man, Christ Jesus. And so that's kind of an anchor verse for us. But I want to take you through. Now we're going to go back to Genesis. Well, here's my outline. Okay. Man and God's image. We're going to talk about male and female, man and woman, God appearing as man. And this is Old Testament stuff. Point. Where's my, where's my, uh, I've got to get the laser here. Where's the laser? There we go. God appearing as a man, then created through Christ. Salvation is in God's plan pre-creation. And God has counted the cost. So hopefully, uh, watch my time, we'll be able to cover all this. In Genesis 1, if you want to turn there in your Bible, if you go to Genesis 1, verse 3, you can look. I'll have it in the slides, but you can follow along. There's a pattern to the days of creation. And you'll see it, but I'll tell and then I'll show. God speaks. Something comes into existence. God evaluates his own work. God makes separations and distinctions. God names, and a segment of creation is complete. Okay, so let's look at this in Genesis 1, verse 3. This is the first created thing that in the text. In the text, it says, The Spirit of God hovered, moved upon the face of the waters. But the first thing that God says when he makes something is, And God said, Let there, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So you see the pattern there. God speaks a word. Light doesn't have to like start traveling from somewhere. Eventually, four light years later, it'll reach Earth, or something like that. He speaks, and light is. When he evaluates it, you know, if it was bad, he would, he would say, it's no good. But he sees it, and he evaluates it truthfully, and he sees it's good. And then he separates, and he names. Now, the days of creation, this is not, we're just going to review this quickly. Day one is light. Four is the firmament in heaven. He makes the firmament, and he separates the waters, calls the water, the, the heavens, the sky heaven. And then beneath, that's, he gathers the seas together on day three. And he calls those seas, and the dry land he calls earth. Earth brings forth vegetation. Now, I want to point out this one. In day four, the heavenly bodies are made, the sun, moon, and stars. Okay? From a materialist perspective, this is not possible. You've got to start with heavenly bodies, and then you, they can start doing a chemical reaction, and they can give you light. You know, you've got to make a light bulb, you've got to get electricity, turn it on, then you can get light. Right? But God makes light, and he doesn't need a sun. Right? So the bearer of the light comes into existence in history after the light. There's also a pattern here that in the, I'll just make this note, in, in days um, two, three, four, sometimes even five, the, the, the numbers three through five get reordered sometimes. God evaluates, makes separation, distinction, God names. But the, all the ingredients are there. Now, in day five, four and five, God makes the birds and the fish, and then, oh, the, excuse me, five and six, the birds and the fish, and then six, the land animals and mankind. God doesn't name the animals of the sea and the air. He stops his naming, and there's a reason for that. God doesn't name the land animals. There's a reason for that. But when he, when he gets the man, there's a break in the pattern. Oh, I wanted to make, I'm getting ahead of myself. Day four, this is just to prove the point. This is when he made the heavenly bodies. But notice this. And they shall be, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Now what is that? That's marking what? That's marking time. You could say history. I, when I was a kid, I remember Haley's Comet came around. I don't think I saw it. But it was like this FOMO thing, the fear of missing out. Hey, if you don't see Haley's coming now, it's going to be 80 years until you get the chance. You know, I don't know. I don't know if anybody here saw it or if it was great. Or, you're probably not going to live to see it again. Sorry. Um, I don't know. Unless you were one. I don't know. Okay. But, uh, well, you could have been five. I don't know. Let's, let's not be pessimistic. But you see here. 
Days and years, sun marks a day, right? The moon, sun, and you get weeks and months out of moon and sun. With the stars, you get big epochs of time, big cycles. So signs and seasons, days and years, history. I'm going to just put the word history. Now, that's how we mark time is by these things. All right? And in Hebrews 11, it says, by faith, we understand that the worlds, and the word for worlds there is really like ages. Okay, there's other different words for world, cosmos. Uh, but this one, and I don't know how to say this word. It's a Greek word, but it, look it up in your Strong's. This is, um, it means like ages, that the worlds. You could say history. By faith, we understand that the world's ages were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which were visible. Think of the light on day one and the sun and the moon stars on day four. God didn't need the physical light-bearing things in order to have the light. All right. In day six, there's another interesting thing in the pattern of creation. And I think this is my next slide. Yeah, I'll go here. So, God goes on, as I said before, he's naming things. When he gets to day five, he doesn't name all the, the fish and the birds. Okay? He doesn't name all the land animals. We know from Genesis 2 that God brings the animals to man, and man names them. But here, God has a counsel. He doesn't just, everywhere else it was God said this, and that became. God said this, and that, and there it was. God said this, and then it was. Here, God is like, it's like he's taking counsel and says, let us make man. And the word there is Adam. I'll get into these words in a second. In our image. Now, we've established before that you could say, well, this is God and angels or something, but there's nowhere in the Bible that man is made partially in the image of God and partially in the image of angels. It said man is made in the image of God. Okay? So God is, it's a plural here, let us. Who's he talking to? It must be the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Making man in our image, according to our likeness. And here's his, he's already designed before he's even formed and made. His job is laid out. Let them have dominion. Them, plural. He has productivity and procreation and expansion already in, in mind. And then it says, so God created man, which is Adam, in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male, this is the sexual pair here. I'll show you the words Male and female. This is not man and woman. This is males, a car, and female. You can have male and female animals. So male and female are both in the image of God, and God calls man Adam. Now, what's this word, Adam? We say, well, that's Adam's name, and it is used as a, as a name for Adam, but it comes from this other word. This is just, you can get this online. This is like the Strong's you know, references for these words. And up at the top, that's the word you'll see for man. When it comes from this other word, you see ruddy, and it comes from this other word, to show blood in the face. Keep that in mind as we go on, okay? Something about blood is, is interesting here, all right? Male and female. These are the words zakar, and properly remembered or marked. Um, the male and female, it's easy, you know, with birds, or you know, think of turkeys, it's easy to see a male. Versus a female, it's easier to recognize the male um, cardinal. It's easier to recognize it anyway. And then the female word is definitely, if you look into the words, it's definitely the sexual function, the sexual pair, male, female. Those are the words used here. So car and knuckleball. So there again, you see it. Man and woman. Let's get into this. So in Genesis chapter two, it says. And the Lord God formed man. So now it's not just God planning, let us make man. This is like the hands-on work. The Lord God formed man, Adam is the word used, of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. I don't have the word here, but it's nephesh, which means like soul, life. Animals, too, can have nephesh, lifeness to them. Nefesh is not what separates man and the animals. It's made in the image of God that separates man and the animals. All right? So then Adam is made. He's formed from the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living nefesh. 
But then God sees the first thing that isn't good is that man is alone. Okay, we're going to get into these words. Here we go. Um, man as a solitary person, it's not good for him to be alone. So it says, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib from which the Lord God had taken um, from man, Adam, he made into a woman. Okay, now we got a new word, Isha. And he brought her to the man, Adam. Now, what does Adam say? And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. It's interesting, he doesn't call himself Adam. He was called Isha because she was taken out of Adam. Now it just said that, right? Right here. Made her into an Isha and brought her to the Adam. But then he names her. She shall be called Isha because she was taken out of Ish. And that's man as a, a lone person. Okay, now he's got a feminine counterpart. Ish is from this word. It just means like a, a man is an individual. Now, it's always used in the Bible as a male person, but um, it's not emphasizing the sexual pair, a man is a male, but is a man as an individual. And then the feminine, oh no, and the plural of that, you see the words are connected here, the plural is this enosh, and it comes from this word enosh, which means to be frail or feeble. And, and so enosh is a mortal. This all ties in, I'll give you, and you've got these slides for a reference, but... All right, then Isha, the woman, is the feminine of Ish. All right, and that's all. So it's, uh, again, the woman taken out of man. There's a, there's a last name applied. So we've covered uh, Adam, um, Ish and Isha, Zakar and Nekobah, and there's a sixth one. If you see, a, uh, like a, we have a super book the kids watch in, the, in creation, the kids visit Adam and Eve pre-fall, and they introduce themselves, and they say, I'm Adam, and this is Eve, and Eve says, I'm Eve, or something. Well, strictly speaking, the name Eve doesn't come into history until chapter 3, post-fall, and here's how it happens. When the woman is deceived by the serpent, she takes the fruit, the man joins her. It says in the scriptures, it wasn't the man who was deceived, but it was the woman who was deceived, but the man joins her knowingly, I know this is not right, but I'm, I'm going to stick with her, I guess, instead of, you know, uh, we'll just figure it out later. So he doesn't save his wife. They both fall. And then God, when he shows up, he's got something to say to the serpent and something to say to the woman. And this was in her slides from last week, too. I will put enmity between you, this is God talking to the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, her seed, he shall bruise your head. So there's a, he's prophesying doom to the serpent, and there's going to be a seed of the woman. And then to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. That's the point I want to emphasize here. And so Adam responds to this, and he calls his wife's name Eve, which is, I, say, I think you're supposed to say like, like this, Chava, okay? Chava, because she was the mother of all living. Living. So this word... Life giver. Okay. The redemptive line has to come through the woman. It has to. It's all set up here. So the life has to come through the woman. It can't come through the man. If, and I'm going to just flip here real quick. I don't have it in my slides. But in uh, John chapter 1, it says... As many as received him, clearly talking about Jesus, to them he gave the power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, Adam, blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay? Now, it says in Galatians, Paul says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born of a woman, all right? And so the virgin birth is there, and the redemptive history of man born of woman, when, I'm going to go here real quick, you don't have to turn there, but 
In Luke chapter 1, when Mary visits Elizabeth, Elizabeth, it says, it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. So be ready, what you hear here comes from the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So she stands out among women, not just of her time, you know, like a Miss America thing, like, well, these are the people just this year, you know. No, well, sir, are you among women? Does not the Holy Spirit know all women, right? So this is the woman and redemption coming through the woman. Oh, and by the way, uh, in, uh, what's Jesus' first miracle in the book of John? It's Jesus turning the water to wine at the wedding. And he's there because his mother is involved in the wedding. It's like related to the family. And when she's got her concern about the wine running out, he says, what does he say to her? He says, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. Is he just being disrespectful and being like, woman? You know, like, I don't think so. I think Jesus knows. And see, he's referring to as a woman. And we see through the Holy Spirit, we know that Mary is blessed among women because she's the mother of the Messiah. All right, keep that in mind. We're moving on. According to our likeness, we saw in Genesis 126, let us make man according to our image. Let's make man in our image and according to our likeness. Now, it's easy to get into this thing, and I know there was a quote up here. I, didn't, I don't have it um, from... Charlie used it in his slides the past couple weeks. And it's from um, like a doctrinal statement, I think from the Eastern Orthodox Church, where it was something about um, God became poor and deified creation. And it's, it gives you, it gives you, it can kind of lead you in a way of like, the world was there and we were this alien thing and he, sh he decided to visit. And he decided to, like, again, put on the costume. It'll make him look like a person and come down. And so we would listen to him because we wouldn't relate, you know. Um, and I don't think the Bible gives you a lot of room for that. We're made in God's image. And even in the Old Testament, so historically pre-incarnation, the word became flesh, right? Pre-incarnation, the Old Testament, I'll give you three examples and there's more. Um, God appears to men as a man. As appearing as a mortal and you'll see the words used now this is uh, we can call this the three visitors this is Abram and he's sitting uh, it says the Lord appeared to Abraham I, I'm sorry if I mess, mix up Abram and Abraham here uh, by the terebinth trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day so it's hot He's sitting in some shade so he lifted his eyes and looked and behold three men and that's that word enosh frail feeble mortal. They appear, there's three men, okay? They don't look like angels, only dazzling light. They're standing by him, and when he saw them, he ran from the tent door, and he bowed himself to the ground and said, my Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. And he goes, and he says, let me get you water and bread, and they, they actually eat the food. So I don't know what you make of that, but it's clear from Genesis 18, this is leading into the Lord goes down to visit Sodom. It's clearly God showing up to Abram. And how does he appear? He appears as, I don't want to get into this, is God one of the guys and there's two angels with them? Or is the whole vision one of the Trinity? Um, we could spend time on that. And what I just want you to see that when Abraham saw them, they looked like mortals, and, but he knew it was the Lord. And he talked with him as if to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to him with the authority of God. Okay? This is um, Jacob wrestling with God. And Jacob arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 sons, and crossed over the fort of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had, all his possessions. If you remember, he's, he's going back to see his brother Esau. And he's afraid. And he's really like... Um, it's a pivotal moment, okay? And he sends over all, he's a very shrewd guy, he sends over all his stuff, and then he's alone. He's got his stuff into two groups, you know? And he's like, well, if he attacks here, then I at least I have half my sons if he attacks there. Um, so here he is by this bank of this river all alone. 
It's important there, I think, all alone, right? It's the, like an ish, an alone person. And a man, an ish, wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And Jacob said, no, and that this man, who's this, all right? Let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So who's, who's he asking for a blessing from? So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. You know, some of your scriptures will say have overcome. You struggle with God and with men have overcome. So many promises to overcomers in the New Testament. Uh, in the Revelation, to him who overcomes, I'll give the stone with the name on it that no one knows except the one who gives it and the one, whoop, lost my batteries. The one who gives it and the one who receives it. There's a name. So what's this, this thing of naming is dominion. And God names this man. I, it's the son of God, I, I think. Can you show me otherwise? The son of God wrestling with Jacob as an ish, as a man. And so it wasn't a ghost. You know, he's like doing this and it's a spirit. It was a physical tussle. And he renames him. For you have struggled with God. And then Jacob sees it. Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. He doesn't say, like, hey, my name is Jesus. Okay, because he does, he's like, I can't tell you my name. And he blessed him. This man, this Ish, blessed Jacob. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Jacob believed he had seen God. He had wrestled with God, appearing as an Ish. This one I'm going to go quick on. It's a lot of stuff in Ezekiel with all these visions that Ezekiel has in chapter 1 of these angels, the wheels within the wheel. Um, there's that spiritual, Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air, and it's, it's almost like a gyroscope of fiery wheels with eyes and four-faced angels. It's very wild stuff. But in verse 6 it says, And above the firmament over their heads, these angelic beings, this is the vision of Ezekiel, was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man, Adam. And then he describes his appearance. He definitely looks like a man, but he's filled with light, like, a, like he's a gem light radiating out of him. Color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw the appearance of fire with brightness all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So clearly in the Old Testament, we have visions of people and direct. This is later in Israel's history, right? And this is a vision. And there's one, a man. There's a form of a man sitting on the throne. Okay? And before we see in Genesis actual visitations of and then Jacob at night wrestling with this man. The last one I'll give you is this one. It's in, uh, I don't have it in my slides, but in Daniel, when the men are thrown into the fiery furnace. Do you remember this? And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar is mad that they won't bow to his image that he set up. He says, these men were bound in their coats and their hose and in their hats and other garments, and they were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames of the fire slew those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He's doing this in his wrath. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and rose up in haste and spoke and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Look, I see four men loose. Huh. They're free. Four men loose, walking in the middle of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. 
So this is a, um, a pagan king. I believe that Nebuchadnezzar later becomes a believer, but he's, he's a bad dude. He's not, a, he's not like um, having religious visions. Here he is gonna kill these guys because they don't worship his statue. And he says, I see four men, and I threw three men. And the one, the fourth one, is like the Son of God, okay? So, the appearance of God is a man in the Old Testament. Created through Christ. Now, we're going back to creation. The scripture clearly shows in many places that the world were made through Christ. And we can say, yeah, well, where God was made through God, yeah. Christ is not just God. I'll, I'll make my case here. Hebrews 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past history to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, history, marking times, seasons, years, spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And that's the same word for worlds um, in Hebrews 11 that the worlds were framed by the word of God through the word of God. The Greek word here is dia. We still have this, I think, with a diameter. He, it was a diatribe. Uh, the way he acted, it was diabolical. Um, dia. And what, what does it mean? Okay, he made the worlds through his son. And then here, he being the brightness of his glory and the express image, made in the image of God, image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had had himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high so this is this is developing the case later for this he had himself purged our sins but clearly here we have the son of god through whom god made the worlds so this word is a, a preposition denoting the channel of an act so I, it would, you could say, um, I watered the garden through the garden hose, or I spoke to the people through my spokesperson. I acted through, um, I bought this property through an LLC that I set up. I acted through this thing. That's how you use the word. And here we have the scripture teaching us, telling us that God made the world through his son. Genesis 1 says, let us, and has a plural Elohim for God, but it doesn't say there, and it was, oh yeah, the Son, the Spirit was doing this, and the Father, and the Son, it was when it came to making stuff, he went, the Old Testament doesn't develop this, but it's there. And then here in the New Testament, we see, made the worlds through his Son. Here in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, now we're not saying Son, now we're saying Word. But I think it's all the same person. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made dia, Him. Through Him, through the Word. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So again, linking Him to born of woman, born of Eve, the life giver, right? In Him was life. John 1, verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Just quickly on this, uh, I, I'll, lose, I'll lose half of you here, but I'm a big Bob Dylan fan, I always have been. He made this, uh, he has a song, um, is it the Solid Rock? I think it's the song, The Solid Rock. In the late 70s, early 80s, Dylan made what was, were called his uh, Born Again albums. I mean, it's, in terms of gospel lyrics, like, I, there's not much that competes. And, uh, but he says, he says um, uh, what does he say in this song? For me, he was chastised. For me, he was hated. For me, he was rejected by the world that he created. And there's a show on TV, I've never watched a whole thing of it, but it's like undercover boss or undercover CEO. And it's like the premise is like, 
you know, the CEO of Domino's or something is like making a pizza in one of the franchises and like the store manager maybe is like, oh, you know, Derek, you're kind of slow with the, can you pick it up with the, and he'll always bumbling around, oh shoot, you know, and then it's like boom at the end, oh, it's the CEO, wow, aren't you glad you treated the CEO pretty nice? And they might be like, well, I shouldn't have, you know, but this whole thing, like, it makes a distinction here about the world he made didn't know him, and then he came into his own, and this is like you're coming to your family's house, and they open the door, and there it's you, I know who you are, and I'm closing the door. This heavy duty. He came into the world he made. It's not just him putting on a human suit, oh wow, God, that was cool, you relate to us, we got these two arms and legs, and you know, very nice of you to try to relate by looking like us and stuff. He made this world. He made the form of man. We're made in his image. And he comes to that world, and the world says, who are you? And then he comes to his own, and they kind of know, but they don't want him. And that was what God was willing to put up with. And I want to make, I'll develop this further here. Not just when he decided to come in the incarnation, but when he decided to proceed with the creation. He knew that. And he said, I'm doing it. Ephesians 3, and this is Paul. This is, um, I can't give all the background. We have this huge eight slides. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all see what is the fellowship I think that's the word for like administration, like how this is rolling out. And make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. That's something known and real by God, but revealed in history. Uh, mystery in history, uh, rhyme. Which from, now check this out, if this doesn't blow your mind. Which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. So now we don't just have the son, his son, oh, that's, you know, of course, God, he's a divine, he can create through his son. Ah, what's it to me? He creates through his son. But then it's the word, and John clearly says, and the word was made flesh, and now we've got this Jesus Christ. Jesus, there's no just keeping this up in heaven now. There's, there's no, you're, 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 you're in, you're committed. Jesus Christ, Jesus, other people were named Jesus during his time. If your name is Joshua, you've got the same name as Jesus had. You know lots of Joshua's. My brother's Joshua. But so other people were named Jesus. Like Jesus, how do you know Jesus? You go back in that time. Who would, well, Jesus who? A lot, I know a lot of Jesuses. Great name, okay? So that was his human name, his incarnated name. Jesus. Now Christ. Is the Christ just God up in heaven? No, that's not going to work. The Christ is... The Messiah. Messiah's got to be a man. Messiah has to come in history. Some Jewish people now are still waiting for Messiah. It's going to be a man. It's got to be. So they were this thing of the Messiah being a man and being fully man and fully God is developed in the Old Testament up until when Jesus comes. But we know that Jesus had a problem when people thought, well, you're saying you're God? They would have had less trouble with him saying he's the Messiah. Christ means the Messiah got to be a man. You got to be incarnated to be Christ. Okay? And how is it that God created all things through a human person, Jesus Christ? There's a phrase in the New Testament, uh, and it's, it's this one from the foundation of the world, and some of you see before the foundation of the world. And I'll show you some variations. Now may the God of... This is in a benediction. Okay, I like this because in a benediction, it's like, okay, church is over. Okay, you know, saying this thing. Okay, great, we're going home, you know. It's like, it's over now, you know. But in this thing, it's used as a benediction. It comes at the end of this epistle. This is slipped in there, the he, this heavy-duty thing. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, 
make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. I've looked this up. You can look it up. And people, there's different debates in theology over covenants, and we're dispensationalists here, and here, and that's what we teach. And um, so, covenantal theologians or reformed theologians will talk about covenant of law, covenant of works, or a bit like a covenant of works and a covenant of grace. I don't want to wade into the hall. This is this covenant. This is that covenant. Um, now the debate is over the new covenant. Is it, in, is it happening now or is it a covenant for Israel? Clearly in the Old Testament, it is for Israel. Um, what part do we play in it as believers? I'm kind of trying to leave that alone for now to get into all, all the covenants stuff. But I want to point out two things about this scripture, and there's more to come. It involves two things I want you to see. Blood and this, which could slip by, May the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. This is telling you God couldn't just bring up Jesus from the dead. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm God, so, you know, sorry, guys, I'm bringing up my son from the dead. Scripture clearly teaches that he who knew no sin, it says God, the Father, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Jesus died in his body. He was dead. God can't just willy-nilly say, yeah, I'm just going to raise my son from the dead. I know he became sin and all, but he had, there had to be, God cannot do unjust things. He cannot do um, injustice. He cannot do unrighteousness. He cannot lie. He cannot just do, he cannot violate his character. God brought up Jesus from the dead using a tool, or you could say using a money. He financed this some way, and how was it? Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Remember when we looked at this word Adam? Why is there blood? This word Adam, red, ruddy, to show blood in the face. There's this thing about blood even when the creation of of Adam. 1 Peter 1, 17 through 19. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves to the time of your stay here in fear. Well, Next time I'm up here, we'll talk more living now in the mortal body day to day. What I'm trying to establish for you today is the anchor for doing that. Because it's messy. Life is messy and hard. And you fail. And you stumble. And things happen. Even when you do everything right, there's others that do what is wrong. And there are real victims in life. You know, that there's, this is a world of sin. And we struggle with sin in our mortal body. And we also, even when it's not our fault, struggle in a world that is marred by sin. So that's the context for this, him saying, conduct yourselves through the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not, now this is the anchor, this goes down, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Before, not even before day six, before the foundation of everything, but was manifest in these times for you. Look how he says these last times. Who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Hebrews 9. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Keep that image in your mind. I don't remember the quote, but seated seated next to God Almighty is a member of the human race. 
Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another, repeated every year. But Jesus is not going into the temple in Jerusalem again and again. Think of the Passover image. Um, if you've ever been to a Seder, um, whether it's a, 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 a Jewish friend that you have that's a believer, or if um, I've been invited to Seder's... Um, Amy's here. Uh, with, uh, Gil did the one at your house. And he comes from a Jewish, if you know Gil Rosenfeld? Rosenfeld. Um, he's a believer, but he grew up in Jewish. I was invited to a Seder by my non-believing Jewish friend. And, but, and so neat, you know, to, he brought in some Gentiles with him. And he even asked his parents, he's like, now, let's, you know, will you explain some things for the Gentiles here? Uh, if you've been to a Seder, you celebrate the Passover. But what isn't done every year? What isn't done? They're not sprinkling blood on the door every year. The, the angel of death is not coming every year. That was the blood, you know. They don't do that part. God didn't say, no, do that again, because the angel of death coming around again. You don't got the blood, you're dead, or your son is dead. But they still remember it, okay? So if... Jesus was just bringing his blood into the temple in Jerusalem. He, now, this is a hypothetical, but it makes the point. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. As it appointed into men's once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Jesus will appear in history again. But he's not going to come into existence in history in the, in the future. He didn't come into existence in Bethlehem. He appeared. Now, he was manifest in history. The word became flesh. It wasn't a hologram. But God had already agreed to this before the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, this is about the Antichrist. Now, check this out, the points here. You can skip ahead and read the underline. The Antichrist was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority. Look at that. He was given authority. Who gave him the authority? God. To continue for three and a half years. That's, I think, right? 36 plus 42 months. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God. <laughs> he was given this authority, but okay. To blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And all authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. That's going to be a bad time. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from, before, from the foundation of the world. And now here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And you may hear messages about this, and your mind goes to like, yeah, like I'm in a cloud, and everything is, I'm blessed with something, peace, I don't know. I got spiritual gifts, maybe. It's, but it's in the, I don't know, it's up there. Now, but God really brings it down to us it matters that Jesus is in heaven now. It matters. But verse 4, he, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, now you're really in, now you're in neck deep. Because it's not just God chose the church. God chose some people. He chose something who's good. He chose a building and you people come into it. When Jesus left the disciples, what did he say? I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for any old body who's like in the church. I don't know. It's going to be nice, you know, general enough to meet most people's prayer. No. For you, you. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, how could he do it? He had to agree 
to pay for the sin he knew was coming even before he decided to create the world. According, okay, that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. He wanted to do it to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood shed from before the foundation of the world, already agreed to, already worked out. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he made abound to us in all wisdom and prudence. Meaning, in wisdom he knew how to roll it out. He knew how to teach it. He knew how to unfold it. But it was always there. It wasn't being dribbled out like um, Toyota, they say, has like a, it's just supposed to be some efficient model of production. Uh, what's it? Just in time, just in time manufacturing. Oh, we have orders for 15 Toyotas. I'll make the 15 Toyotas. I don't want to hold on to inventory. It's very inefficient. God is not, this is not just in time salvation. Ah, oh, there's sin. Oh, let me see. What can we do? Guys, uh, oh, no. He purposed, look at this, having made known to us the mystery, that's the hidden thing revealed in history, the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed how? Consulting us? Consulting the devil, maybe? The angels? Hey, angels, what do you think? I don't know. What are we going to do? He purposed in himself. Now, with all that in mind, go back to Genesis 126, and that is what God knew when he said, let us make man. He went ahead with this. He knew it. And it was all built in. There's a parable which God tells, Jesus tells, and you'll hear it. I'm getting, we're getting close. I think we're, I'm going to be on time. Jeff, I hope I haven't talked too fast. He told me, you're going to go too fast. So stop. Okay. You'll hear this um, when you want to be a believer or people are coming, count the cost. You know, what's it going to cost you to be a Christian? And Jesus says this in Luke 14. And what's the context? Great multitudes were going with him. And he turned and said to them, If anyone does, comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish. What is the word foundation? We have all these word verses with that word. Foundation, foundation. After he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. And then he goes on and he says to believers, or people following, and they're not necessarily believers, but he's saying, You know, you guys are following me now. It's kind of a popular thing, you know. That's cool and all, but have you, are you counting the cost? Now, that's, it's often presented that way, and is, uh, it's legit. But I want to go back here, and I don't want to underline this. Whoever does not bear his cross, he doesn't say here bear Jesus' cross. We do carry around in our body the death of Christ. You know, when we have communion, we do, uh, without the cross, we have no forgiveness of sins. But here it's not Jesus' cross, it's the disciples' cross. And what is he doing? He's coming after Jesus. So if I submit to you, if Jesus is telling this to people, he himself has done it first. He counted the cost. The rest of it, I didn't put it in here. He uses the analogy of war. What king going to make war against another king doesn't sit down first and consult whether he is able to, with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000? Or else, when the other is a great way off, he sends an ambassador and, and gets terms of peace. And, they, and so likewise, whoever of you that does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. But what God is asking of us, he's done first. Historically, when Jesus calls Peter and Andrew, 
Come after me. It says they just leave their nets and follow them. So it doesn't go into like, and they really thought, now what's it going to cost to follow Jesus? You know, I don't know. Peter looking ahead, I'm going to be crucified. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not really, I don't want to go in for that. Or no, I guess I consider it, I'm going to go, I'm going to do it. He doesn't know all that's going to unfold in his life. He doesn't know it. I mean, and yet he follows him. I submit to you that God has counted the cost first. If you work in projects, you, you have contracts and uh, like the, the scope of work, right? So I work with this, I can get into details of what I do, but work with the product and it's like you got to know the schedule for this um, it's a speaker ready room technology. What's your speaker ready room schedule? Okay, you got to know that. Well, when the contract is signed, they don't really know that. So like, you're building in days for travel, days for setup, days for execution, days to get back home, because you have to ship things and send people. So often you have to have a change order because it's like, whoa, whoa, you know, you, now your schedule is expanded, so we're going to need more days. Let me send you a revised contract. In God's plan, there are no change orders. There are no cost overruns. Oh, you know, I didn't work this into my plan. This, the people have fallen? Oh, Adam, Eve ate the fruit? Oh, shoot. No, it's just not in there. And we could say, yes, holy God, that's wonderful, so wonderful. Yes, of course, he's so great. This has implications for us today in your life, in your messy life day to day. God decided to move ahead with the plan of creation, and he had you in mind. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And there are no losses of deposit. You know, you put a, if you rent a place, you put down a security deposit. Uh, you know, you, you have a party there, and your friends trash the place. You know, oh, it's a couple hundred bucks. You know, whatever. Okay. Well, you know, see you, landlord. Um, no, God doesn't lose his deposit. We'll go into this next time. But when the Holy Spirit is given to believers as what? A deposit, and it says blank, our inheritance, guaranteeing God is getting his money out of the project. He invests, he's, he's seeing it through. He's not saying, well, yeah, I, put, you know, I hedged my bets. I mean, I put some money here, I put some there. Well, I lost on them, but okay, we got you guys. That really worked. No, I just, show me from the scriptures where that is. God doesn't lose his deposit, and God doesn't break the contract. And how does he do it? Now, the covenant of the law, the people broke it, and God knew, he said, I have to make a new covenant with them because he found fault with the people, right? But the everlasting covenant, he had to agree to everything he knew. And he knew, the father knew what it would cost him. It would cost him his son. The son knew that it would cost him separation from the father. And he went ahead with it. Philippians 1, Paul says to this church, we're coming in near the end. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. The man who started the tower is finishing it. He laid the foundation. What does Paul say the foundation is? Jesus Christ. It's God's project. You're his project. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out, we'll get into this more next time, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because you're going to lose it? No. Because maybe you'll make it, oh, I don't know, are you going to make it? No. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure because God's got you. And you're making it. You're getting there. It is not possible to be in any situation that God has not already created through Christ. He created you through Christ. And every situation, the worlds, but he framed the worlds, the ages, the history, through Christ. God did not create evil. 
but he did create history through the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. When John the Baptist sees Jesus, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And you can do this in your life. Shoot, it's hard. But the devil, I, I just, I'll say myself, I know I'm not alone. The devil will eat your lunch with this stuff of, I should have done this. I shouldn't have done that. This was never supposed to happen. Yes, but I was supposed to do this and I didn't do it. So now I'm lost. So now I'm out of God's will. So now I'm going to suffer loss. So now I'm going to, who knows? Yes, God was trying to, he had the door open on the ark. Hey, come in the ark, but I didn't go. And now here I'm going to die in the flood. Hey, tell me this is not, the devil will come. Oh yeah, but just see, yeah, God had a plan and all. Yeah, that was cool, but for people who obeyed, Nate, and well, you really didn't. And so look at this. You brought shame to the Lord and, you know, just give up. We can resist the temptation to despair because it's anchored. Our daily life in this mortal body is anchored in an agreement God made with himself. And we weren't in the meeting. We can always be joyful, thankful, confident, secure. It doesn't mean we always feel happy or we feel, God, shoot, we're not always going to feel confident. What does the word confident mean, by the way? You know that? Con means with, fide, semper fi, faithful. With faith is confident. You got these guys, success guys, you know, it's like confidence. Let me teach you confidence, you know. They're like in a pickup artist or something. Yeah, you got to have, you know, you got to really show confidence. You know, this thing, it's an act, right? Confidence comes from with faith. With faith in us, with faith in you, with faith in me. No. Our faith is in God. And we are secure. We are secure, folks. We can always act. Now that we always do, we work at our salvation, our salvation with fear and trembling. We pray always. What is this? Be joyful always. Pray without ceasing and everything. Give thanks. So we can always be joyful. If there's sin, confess sin. It's not some long thing of... Um, Penitence and a long, oh, yes, I know it's since I'm going to, you know, I got to like punish myself for a while. Confess sin and move on. God has already worked it into his plan. We can always be joyful, always thankful, always confident, always secure. God knew the things in your life, whether it was divorce, you know, abortion, um, unfaithfulness, you, uh, some thing in your past, something in your family, something in the world, something that's happening right now, something that you look around and see, this is jacked up. I don't know if you don't look around the past couple years and see it's jacked up. I don't know, but it's jacked up. But God knew it all. He framed the world through Jesus Christ, through his word. He's in control. I know we say that. It's like, yeah, God's in control. You know, of course. But he's got you. He's got you. Um, there's a, there's a, I'm not a, a military guy. I never served in the military because I keep my hair short. People say, hey, you've been in the military? No, it's just because I'm like, my hair is getting thin. I have to keep it really short. Um, but this is, again, something Charlie said years ago, and I, I just take his word for it. And if anybody has been a Marine, you can say whether this is not true or is true. But uh, the picture here is of a, a group of young men who were um, boot camp to be Marines. And the drill sergeant is an older dude and time tested. And it might be a super nice guy. Hey, by the way, do you know that Bob Ross was a drill sergeant in, in the Army? Do you know that? How's calm and thing? He went into that. Sharon told me this. Like, he went into that painting thing. He talks real quiet because he's like, I just don't want to be shouting at people, you know, keep on. I did that, you know. But a drill sergeant, think of, he acts like a real jerk, you know. He's kind of mean. And yet, he's got a goal to train those men to be Marines. And this is the thing. You maybe have heard Charlie say this. But he says to those guys, he's like, gentlemen, when you complete this course of training, you will be United States Marines. And so this is the thing of he's got you, but he's got you. You're, gonna, you're getting through the training program. And when you do, you will be what he knows 
he can turn you into because you don't know anything about being a US Marine when you're just enlisted, right? It's the drill sergeant's job to make you one. And so I hope that this is encouraging you and to show you from the scriptures that the foundation for our salvation, even our own creation, is in what God purposed in himself before the world began. And so that nothing that you encounter in daily life can fall outside the scope of the project. He's not surprised by any of it. The whole thing is baked into the budget, and he's got the money to cover it. And with that, I wish you a Merry Christmas. Tim's going to come up and close us in prayer. Um, if you're not here next week, we will see you and have a great holiday. Well, thank you, Nate. I can honestly say, I, I can testify to the fact, the man came with a message today, amen? amen. <laughs> and what a great application. Um, it's hard to argue with scripture, isn't it? Uh, not how he interpreted it, but what the Lord said. So amen, and we had a good message today. Thank you, Nate. We appreciate that. One reminder this evening, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Live nativity for the people who are still alive and not sick. <laughs> We're all gonna be here. But we're having a special event. Special event, 901. It's Jack Taft first memorial teardown session. Anybody here wants to help Jack Taft and the rest of the crew? Uh, Dwayne is fighting the battle with the flu, so pray for that situation. But if you're here at 9 a.m., 9 p.m., not 9 a.m., 9 p.m., we're gonna tear this thing down in about half an hour. But uh, more than that, we're going to be praising what the Lord has done this evening. So just a, a quick reminder, be here for the event and help us if you can. Quick uh, encouragement to everyone from Psalms 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Amen. It's Christmas. Let's celebrate and uh, hope to see you this evening. Thanks for coming, everybody. Have a great week.